Welcome to the Church of God Network podcast, everybody. I'm here today with a very special guest, Jonathan Reedy, who might have the personal record for uh, longest time knowing me of any of the guests so far on the, the podcast. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So we when did, did you move when did you move to Westchester, by the way? Uh summer of nineteen ninety-seven. So how old would that have made you? <laughs> six. I would have been okay. six. Yeah. <laughs> so that attracts. Yeah. So this is uh this is a guy who not only has uh known me through my formative years and, and been an inspiration to a number of things, but also turned me on to The Matrix and Apocalypse Now and Roxy Music. So uh <laughs> it's an impactful guy in my life. <laughs> across a lot of uh, across a lot of spheres then okay yeah absolutely so we brought him on today to talk about leadership because he's very uniquely qualified which i guess you can't modify unique as a word right so that's a little redundant but you're unique uniquely qualified to talk about this subject um a lot of folks might know you from being on the board of directors for the international center for world peace but your day job let's see if i have this title correct here is director of talent for corporate functions. So explain to the people, and by the people, I also include me, what exactly that means. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, I mean, some of these corporate jobs, they have ridiculous titles, but yeah. my, my, yeah. my work, um, that what I'm doing right now really reflects pretty well what I've been doing for a number of years in different companies. Um, I, I work internally as a sort of a consultant, and I help teams, leaders, frontline workers um, to do better what they're good at. So a lot of us bring a lot of talents into our jobs wherever we're working, but there are very few jobs that use all those talents. And mm -hmm. so I help people access learning that helps them improve themselves, or I help them find a good fit with a job or carve out the next steps in their development in, in planning that or even job moves. So it, it the talent management um, label is just a a nice way of talking about what do people have and what does the company have when it has this collective set of talents and individuals and how do we bring that out for the best benefit of individuals and the company yeah and it for for context for folks listening or watching um this is sort of uh not only directly in in jonathan's wheelhouse but for me something i've become interested in over the last couple of years uh primarily from uh, starting doing some coaching with you uh, maybe a year and a half ago or so and learning mm -hmm. some interesting things about myself through that process. Uh, but also as a result, after having sort of some of the language around this topic in my mind, viewing certain things in society or, or sports or in the church, especially, which is what I hope we can relate this to today, that where this subject has become so relevant and you can appreciate certain people's skill sets for being able to accomplish things with people, uh, realize how hard it is to to be uh, a leader and how many nuances there are in that process. But before we get into the the meat of the podcast, you want to tell folks a bit more about your background, both in the church and maybe a bit professionally as well. Sure. So, um, church. I, I was born and raised in the Worldwide Church of God, and I uh, spent most of my my lifetime in the Worldwide Church of God. Um, I've come in contact with people across all the church, uh, wherever it is. And um, so my, my contact ranges around the world because my career took me around the world. I've, I've, um, I've been in these corporate type jobs um, shortly after finishing Ambassador College. So I finished Ambassador in the mid 90s and then um, went on into um, what's called learning and development at, at, at the time that was kind of the big title for it it's now more in the in the, in the range of talent management the, the, the vocabulary and uh, i had prepared to be a teacher at ambassador i thought i was going to be a, a teacher but then i didn't like the babysitting involved in you know the the adolescent development issues that i had as a teacher in a classroom so i i didn't stay in that and i floundered a bit and then found this field of corporate learning and said, oh, well, yeah, I, I, I'm prepared for that. Okay. But what, what, what layered into it that I wasn't expecting was beyond just training human beings, especially adults, we don't just need to sit in a classroom. Mm -hmm. And so I hope we can get into that topic today because I think that it, it, it carries over quite a bit into the way in which God works with us. We don't sit in church all week long. 
we do have a dose of that, but then we have to go out and do something with it. And the way in which I have learned, and then I have helped others learn this approach is to think of learning kind of inter integrating into all aspects of my life, my work, my family, certainly interactions in the church and with my own spiritual growth individually with God. And so the, the models that I have that I use in my corporate life translate for me very, very directly into the way in which we think about this in the church. So yeah. I, I grew through these jobs in different American companies moving um, around the U.S. and then eventually to Asia and to Europe. Um, and then I spent about 15 years working for Nestle here in Europe. And I'm still in Europe. I, I, I'm, I live near Geneva, Switzerland. And I've worked independently. I've worked inside of corporations, but generally always in the space of really two big areas of work. My main areas of work are in this talent management, talent development area, or in an area of what's known as change management, which is mm. helping companies, I give an example as a consultant, I helped the hotel company making it through COVID-19, right? One of the world's oh, wow. major hotel companies, which is based in France, they had a catastrophe, which is all their hotels got shut down during COVID. How do they manage to survive, keep employees engaged, keep employees growing, and then eventually get their business back online? Yeah. So those are the two areas that that I kind of specialize in. Yeah. And you've you've lived everywhere, it seems like. I mean, I'm, I remember that dating back as long as I've known you. Right. So we we come into contact with you and you move into New York for a bit. And then I think before that, were you I, I didn't you live with Isaac in Denver? Isaac Garcia. Yeah, we were roommates for a while after college in Denver, Colorado. Yeah. Right. So Isaac Garcia, board member, who's also been on the uh, the podcast talking about entrepreneurship. You guys are roommates in Denver. Then I then it was New York. No, Los Angeles. Uh, Los, Angeles. Los Angeles. Yeah. Around the time where a, a lot was happening in the church in the mid 90s, I was mm -hmm. in Pasadena. Yeah. Um, watching it all, um, <laughs> try, trying to trying to make sense of it all and, and seeing that churn. That was quite an experience. And yeah. then it was New York after that. But my career really followed or my, my moves really followed my career. Mm -hmm. So yeah. after New York, I was in Singapore, Yep. came back to San Francisco for a period of time. And then was in uh, Brussels, Belgium for a few years, then Paris, then uh, the south of France and now Geneva, Switzerland. Yeah, the Carmen so, San Diego and, of the church. <laughs> maybe yeah. I, I love it I, yeah. I can't get enough of it and i don't think it's going to slow down but uh i've, I've worked or I've done work in over 50 countries but i haven't lived in that many yeah and and it's this subject is is fascinating for a number of different reasons and and also if, by way of background for you being the son of a minister uh is also very i'm sure impactful in all this i don't know i don't think we've even talked uh, personally about how that might have affected um your career choice or how you maybe internalize some of the things you do now having uh lived with someone who was in a leadership role in the church and and myself while not the son of a pastor the son of a minister i think it does um influence when you start to think about leadership in your life uh but you have a lot of different um, things that bring you to this subject. And I think probably the best place to start is maybe around uh, some key terms or, or language. So, for example, the, what would you say is the difference between leadership and management? It seems like that's sort of a, a some place to, to start there. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's not an easy question to answer. Yeah. Depending on who you're reading, there are different <laughs> points of view on it. And, um, uh, your audience may not be uh, the, the same audience that I'd be speaking to in a business community, but there are certain authors which make a big deal about management and say, getting things done is really important. Um, there was a, an, an excellent book written during the financial crisis or following the financial crisis of uh, 2007, 2008, which drew attention to management and said, American business has lost its way because they can't actually get things done. Hmm. And they criticize this movement that started in the 60s in America of just living in leadership theory land and that Harvard Business and uh, School and, and Wharton and a lot of these schools, which we hold in high regard, did us a disservice in getting away from you got to get stuff done. And there is a thing, a term called man management. 
that just describes getting results through people. Mm -hmm. And it requires systems, it requires structure and governance, and it requires an understanding and an empathy as well. So some people like these authors and a very famous um, author, um, a professor in uh, Montreal, uh, Macquarie School of Business, um, uh, Macquarie University, Ivy School of Business, um, Henry Mintzberg, he speaks about this a great deal. I'm a big fan of that approach. On the other hand, there's a lot of literature that I also admire and that I've followed and have applied very successfully from people like James Collins, whom I know you know, mm -hmm. wrote a, a very famous book called Good to Great. Um, and that that school of thought um, of Jim Collins and of Stephen Drotter and Ram Sharan and other very well-known authors focuses on leadership and says, there need to be other elements that are not just about getting things done, but about the, the inspirational aspect and the communication. What's interesting for me is Stephen Covey, who many people will know from the habits of highly effective people, Stephen Covey, who is no longer living, started a movement which his son now leads. And his son, whose name also happens to be Stephen Covey, has recently written about this subject and tried to bring them together. And I like what he's done because he talks about the very foundational aspects, which are really important. And I think this relates to our spiritual lives. Mm -hmm. He talks about trust and inspire. He, he talks about the, the two pieces. And he, you, can, you can layer on top of that the other things which need to be there. Like I said, the things about getting work done, getting things done through people, the communication and the, the vision and so on. But I, I really like how he gets to these very fundamental concepts because trust means relationship. And in fact, trust correlates pretty closely to faith, right? Mm -hmm. And then inspiration has a dual meaning. Inspiration, you can be an inspiring speaker. You can be an inspiring leader. You can spark something in others. But ultimately, the inspiration that we would speak of, the inspiration which matters most to us, is God's inspiration. So I think that those two concepts are very strongly rooted in the values that you and I hold in common. Yeah. And in the for Church of God Network too, the, the big thing we've realized is that one of the big barriers to to working together across the different Church of God groups is lack of trust. That either trust has been mm -hmm. broken because there are relationships that predate splits, and then you go through the turmoil of breakups for whatever reason, and that trust is broken. Or if you're like in my generation or younger, those relationships have just never formed or because you've been in one group or the other and you don't have exposure to people in the other groups so that trust is hugely important. And I've also found personally that, yeah, people can get motivated to do things by harping on problems, but like the ceiling for productivity is limited with that. <laughs> like it, 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 people respond way more to being inspired or like, oh, look at all these results, like how exciting this is, uh, almost like the fear of missing out. They get FOMO and they want to be involved. And I actually, I was talking with, I forgot who it was, but you know, I even during Worldwide, I think people had plenty of things, even at the time, they probably didn't uh, agree with 100%. My dad talks about being told, you got to throw out your rock and roll records. And He's like, no, I'm not throwing out my records, man. And I mean, I've got them now in my house. But uh, so, but I think people were just so inspired by what they saw and so motivated that they sort of put those things aside and didn't dwell on them, didn't let the negativity of that uh, get hold. And and now I think for a number of reasons, we become a little too focused on those um, negative things. But and the different, yeah. Yeah, so trust yeah. and ins inspire. I mean, that's maybe the two of the biggest issues in the church right now. That's interesting that you say it. I, for me, you know, I, I'm, I'm always tempted when I talk about these things to go into models, but um, I, I won't bore people with details. So I'll just say that a model which I found very effective regarding trust focuses on a number of factors, but one of the most insightful things I find in this is that all the factors involved with trust can be eroded by a single factor 
which is the degree to which I am egocentric, the degree to which I am self-centered and focused on me, I, my. And I think that's a really important thing for us in the church, because as we're in this time where you're kind of alluding to this, there's a um, there, there are differences that are very visible or very, very noticeable, um, then there, there might be a temptation to, to, to say, well, I want to associate with people who make me feel good about me mm -hmm. and who resemble me the most. Yep. And our job in a body, a manager's job, a leader's job, or a member's job is not about me. There's no message in 1 Corinthians 12 that says, look out for yourself. It says, look out for others yeah. and let the body take care of its members collectively. That requires suspending some of my self-centeredness and my fear and my defensiveness. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know if this necessarily relates to the whole leadership versus management thing, but that was one of the big um things through through speaking with you through the the coaching that you and I did that jumped out was the number one for me the realization and you are in a very unique place to speak to this because you've known not only me but my entire family for a long time so you're like oh well Russo's are very I forgot how you put it but like justice driven or something like you you have we have a sense of hey this is this is what we think the right thing to do is and uh we should do it this way but what that does is present a serious limitation to your ability to achieve results in the reality that you're given. And you can't always control that reality. And especially like if you're in a situation where you're not the guy making all the moves at the top, you're sort of sandwiched in between. You might be a manager, but you have leadership above you who, uh, and then you have people who you're responsible for, who maybe you do not always have say in who was hired or who's gonna be hired but you have to achieve results in reality, whether you think reality should be that way or not. And what I realized exactly. then, and what I still realize is that it's not my skill set inherently. <laughs> and, and so it's, it's, it's fascinating to see people who can do that well, but to your point in the church, mm -hmm. deciding who's in it and who's not, it's above our pay grade. So we have to achieve the results that we are, commission to do yeah. whether it is outward to the world and preaching or whether it's internal in terms of getting along and forming relationships we have to do that with the people that god has given us yes i i, I do wonderful point that you you're, you're zeroing in on there and you you talk about the the view upwards in a company and the view to my team um the view upwards a lot of people who have a set of values, whether church members or other people with a set of values, and I, I encounter people in the world as well who have moral difficulties because they look up at the company they're working for and they say, um, you know, in the Nestle group, I don't like the fact that we're introducing billions of plastic bottles into the world. I was in the water business for Nestle. They produced billions of plastic bottles every year. And try as we might to say there's ways of dealing with that. It's bringing into the environment something that God didn't create and that really has a pretty negative effect in almost every respect in, in the downstream um, supply chain. So, so we had we had moral quandaries when we look up and, and our boss says, do this or don't do that. And we feel like we might be compromising if we if we if, if we don't hold to a principle. And we, we, I think all of us in this imperfect world and in imperfect um, relationships and in an imperfect church find ourselves in that difficulty of saying, well, I don't agree 100% with that. Where's the gray area and where is the hard line which I do not permit to compromise? Yeah. And that's, right. and that's a tough thing. And I, and I'm still, I mean, I'm still navigating it. I still don't even really know if I have a good idea where, where that is in terms of, you know, if you're managing people or managing an organization, where is that hard line of, no, we can't tolerate that. That's not what the, whatever the company stands for. This is a hard boundary versus we have to achieve with some folks that not even, not even that you don't like them or you don't, your personalities don't um, go well together. But they might truly be whatever a, a bad worker or they might have um a personality that really rubs people the wrong way and one of the things that that you and i talked about and you know i'm, I'm passionate about is 
and I think it got even more intense after speaking with you and learning about some of this. And that is looking at people in sports and especially coaches and how they achieve results with some people that are really whacked out. Like I, I mentioned to you, uh, Antonio Brown, who, for people who don't know, uh, Pitt, he was a former Pittsburgh Steeler, one of the best wide receivers in the league. And people have been joking for a couple of years now, Mike Tomlin, who's the coach, should be in the Hall of Fame just for keeping Antonio Brown out of trouble for like the better part of a decade. And for context, coincidentally, after he retired, um, Brown moved to Albany, where I am, bought the arena football team in Albany. And in a matter of months, the arena league kicked the Albany empire out of the league because Antonio Brown was failing to make payments to players and co it's been a disaster. And someone like Tomlin with all these personalities, it wasn't just Brown. It was all kinds of people, how someone can have not even just like hold the, you know, keep the ship afloat, but have a lot of success with difficult personalities. And it almost, you mentioned before, um, that the whole leadership view is a little bit more, I don't know, ethereal or hard to quantify than the whole management where you might have metrics you can use or easier to sort of wrap your your mind and your arms around. Whereas this leader, this leadership ability almost feels like magic <laughs> to me. Well, you know, there are books written, leadership is art, leadership is jazz. Um, they're, they're, it's, it's recognized. Um, one of my favorite books is um, First Break All the Rules, written mm -hmm. by Marcus Buckingham. Um, and um, in it, he said people, he, he worked for the Gallup survey organization. Okay. And they had enormous data sets about companies and management uh, tendencies and trends. And, and they, they were looking at these data sets and they came up with 12 questions that really were very, very simple, straightforward questions. And they call it their 12 or the Q12, I think it's called. 12 questions which correlate to great performance. And a lot of them come down to the individual supervisor or manager and what that person does for the conditions of the team. And Marcus Buckingham, in writing this book, he talks about those questions, but one of the most important things he says is, we misapply the golden rule when we try to manage. We often say, well, the golden rule says, do unto others what you would have them do unto you. But he says, it's not about how it's done, though. And so he says, for example, what motivates you and gets you lit up for your work every Monday morning? is probably not the same for most members of your team. And if I approach my team with the mindset of, I know what I want to do this week, I know what excites me, and I want, I know the way in which to transmit that message to me that's the most motivating, I'm, I'm probably going to demotivate a, a good number of my team if I'm using the thing that works for me. So that's, I think, why what you're saying is true. There's no formula. And Marcus Buckingham's conclusion in this book is, look at the stories of all these managers that we surveyed and then the, he interviewed in restaurants, in corporations, in sports teams. And he said, the only thing you find in common is the things that Stephen Covey would talk about. Empathy, self-awareness, awareness of others, awareness of my impact on others, listening, a posture in which I'm asking open questions, in which I'm giving somebody the space and the legitimacy to bring to me their best. And I set the table, I open the door, I facilitate, but I don't commandeer. I don't grab the steering wheel in their career or in their thinking and say, I know you just let me drive. Yeah. And I think that is the challenge, isn't it? Yeah. And it's and it's amazing. I mean, number one, the the all those traits should resonate with people as as uh, integral aspects of conversion in terms of like sort of prerequisites for our own ability uh, to to see where we're falling short, to to um, uh, address the issues we bring to the table, surrendering to God to allow Him to create the the nature of Christ. Like, so sort of, you need those traits individually in your in your relationship. Um, in your conversion experience with God, but when dealing with other people, and the the thing too about all this is that it also speaks to you mentioned a culture of 
not only motivating people, but what I hear in that too is freeing people to do their jobs too, like to either succeed or fail and not micromanaging the situation because this is how it needs to get done or whatever. And one of the things I've thought about for a while regarding the church was that, you know, in reality, the the church is like a special forces unit. Like the the God is calling out a, a people for a very specific purpose and task, and he wants highly trained people uh, in that body. And the same way, uh, if you're going into battle in, in the military, you can't be so dependent on the leader where if he gets shot, well, he's the only one who knows the the objective and, and the plan and what we're supposed to do if we miss our drop zone by five miles. Like you you need leaders to lead and to train you. But then when when you go out into the the real situations, you want individuals who can make decisions on the fly. And with changing information, I, I would I would imagine too, and and be effective. You wouldn't you don't want to create dependence. Could, could you speak a little bit to that phenomenon? Because I see that a lot. Yeah, there's there's a lot of lessons that are drawn from the military. Um, there's there's a book that came out uh, not too long ago called Team of Teams, in which um, a former general writes about how exercises worked, right and then the real the real um battle scenarios um that w- as they played out beyond exercises in the in the real battles um but the common theme is what you said that life is unpredictable life is messy and no way can you have somebody who is in the face of real danger turning around and saying what do i do what I, and and dependent on somebody who has always dictated or all, always held my hand or held the back of the bicycle seat and never actually let me pedal, let me skin my knee. The, the, one, of the, one of the unusual things, and I would say this is a real irony and a challenge for us in the church, is a great enemy of great leadership is perfectionism. Mm-hmm. Now, we use the word, we read the word yeah. perfect over and over in the scriptures, right? The book of James full of the word towards perfection, moving towards perfection, et cetera. But perfectionism, no. (laughs) God knows our frame, right? Remember the psalm, he knows our frame. And among our frame is uh, what Paul struggles with and what he writes in Romans 7, having Mm -hmm. struggled with is, I can't make myself always do what I know and what I've studied. And what when I was praying this morning, what I knew very clearly in my mind I was going to say and do today. And so as a leader of people, or let's say just as a member impacting my fellow members, which is leadership as well, mm-hmm. expecting perfection and being let down by a lack of perfection is the wrong approach. What mm-hmm. we need to do is expect imperfection. In fact, uh, I had a, a, a former boss whose favorite phrase was that the natural result of human communication is misunderstanding. So even being understood is 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 an expectation I need to mitigate. I, I may not get my message across because there's a lot of stuff between what I'm thinking and what they're thinking and yeah. all the mechanisms that we have of transmitting and receiving that message. Did, did you hear, um, so we have a, a mutual friend who actually has also been on the podcast, Bob Yusey. Did you hear... Um, his statement several weeks ago about expectations because it's like perfect it's it's in my memory bank forever now it's um expectations or premeditated resentments <laughs> wow. which is which is great because it that. bob's always got those nuggets yeah and and yep. it's and it's true though because again it's whether it's uh, in my experience relation like romantic relationships or intimate relationships and families you have expectations, expectations usually that are not articulated or not articulated well, and then the person falls short, either whether they understood the expectation or not, uh, and and all of a sudden it's not just okay, how do we correct this to get to the next stage? Then it's like a resentment. It becomes an emotional issue. Maybe even a, it gets moralized, and that's um, and that seems to be a, a big challenge. The moment you bring in, it becomes not just this purely professional thing, but you get into spiritual matters and matters of character. Yes, yes. And I, I think, you know, when, when we when we look at expectations, I think that's a, a very important thing. What what I have in 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 the the instructions about myself as a member in the church, 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, the, the way in which um God tells us this is what it means to be in the body. 
the word that I would say it comes comes out of all that is a word that I use a lot when I'm coaching leaders in business, and that is contribute. Mm -hmm. The most important thing when I'm when I'm moving into an environment where I'm interacting with other people and there are some 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 outcomes that are expected is what am I doing for? Right, and the expectation is the opposite. The expectation is well, ask what your country does for you, right? What what is this company doing that suits me? What is this organization or church saying to me that lands well and makes me feel good? Well, why don't we start with God's instruction and maybe the example of Jesus Christ? Peter says that actually we are called to suffer as Jesus Christ gave an example. Mm -hmm. He was a man of sorrow. Would our expectation be any different? Should it be? Shouldn't we rather go in as Jesus Christ did in expectation that I've got a job. I've got a job and my job has responsibilities before it has rights. And I have to go in to contact with people thinking of where is this group at? Where is the, where is the team at? Where's this individual? And what is it that when we finish this interaction, when we're done having the conversation or this project, where do they, where do they stand? What do they have? that they didn't before I met them. Yeah, and I, and I think there's so many parallels, not only between you know military situations or, or sports situations, but the, the whole desire to contribute, which has been a word that stuck with me for a, a long time as well. Like I, I think one of the things um, growing up with folks like you and my parents and all their friends, it's like when, when, you're, when I was a kid, it was like, man, I can't wait till I'm at that point in my life and I'm part of this group of people to be able to contribute to what's going on here. And it's a, and it's a very team, like it's a team mentality. And it's also really fulfilling when the members of the team all share that mentality. Um, and it's not a, uh, this ego driven, um, this ego driven thing about an individual person, but rather, like you said, how do we, how do we improve the team as a whole? How do, how do I do my part? How do, again, it's, it's based in inspiring one another, not beating each other over the head uh, until obedience is, is uh, extracted. Yes. And when, when you, you know, the teams give uh, sports teams analogies, give us a great basis for this. But to me, if, if I think about two kinds of leadership challenges, one is simply the role of the leader. And, you know, I, I, I think it'd be good to talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. But then the other thing is what you're drawing attention to, which is, bringing together a cohesive group of individuals. So it's not just a bunch of people sitting in a room or a bunch of people that are around a Zoom screen, mm -hmm. but a real team, a real cohesive unit, an organism, not an organization, right? That lives together, that works together, and that have synergies that actually can have force multipliers because they do together better things than any of them did individually. Yeah. Forging that as a leader is a challenge. The first part, the leader's part alone is hard because in my view, leaders have to set a vision, then they have to communicate it. They have to translate that into a strategy. The strategy has to be set into an operational plan because dreaming about a vision and the strategy, I've had some great leaders who, who've helped me understand this. You know, we, we, we would do offsite meetings We'd bring in consultants and we'd have a vision at the end of a day and a half. And you have this funny language that's used in vision statements, right? And it's usually a bit awkward and a bit over wordsmithed, right? Mm -hmm. you go, yeah, that's our vision. Okay, give it to the communications people and everybody will start memorizing that. Yeah. But what is that really? It's, it's words. And, mm -hmm. and by the way, anybody could come up with a vision statement, right? Coca-Cola, Disney, they, they just they manufacture a vision statement. The question is, what do you do with that? Well, you got to build a strategy. But then a strategy, again, consultants or strategy teams, they build it. It's not yet reality. Nothing's been done yet. To actually get things done, a leader's got to take a strategy and turn it into an operational plan, which means what are the resources needed? How are we going to know that we are moving the needle? Who's got what competencies that do certain things better and that I, I really ought to bring in on this kind of work? How do I sequence their efforts and how do I bring them together in ways that 
That is absolutely impossible to copy from another company. It's impossible to do quickly. It's impossible to do easily. Most leaders struggle with that. And there are books written about it called Execution, right? And I've been in companies, I've been in the company that the gentleman who wrote the book called Execution said he turned into an execution-focused company. I was there 10, after, 10 years after he wrote that book, and he did not succeed in making that company <laughs> stained execution focused company after his departure yeah and so it's, it's an enormous challenge that's the leadership but then the other side of it is then what about bringing people together because people individually are not what makes performance they're not what makes great outcomes it's the and you and i have talked about a, a model that is is um, a credit to patrick lencioni um, which talks about five sequential things that teams have to build in order to get the real results that you want. Guess what it starts with? It starts with trust. Mm -hmm. Leaders building trust between other people starts with the leader showing trust and showing trustworthiness. Mm -hmm. But then how do you actually help people get along? How do you deal with conflict? How do you foster healthy conflicts mm -hmm. and not unhealthy conflict? My favorite phrase, how do you phrases, yeah. <laughs> How do you get people to share responsibility and not feel territorial? How do you get people to look at one another and appreciate you do something better than I do? And I look up to you for that. I esteem you better than myself on that. And when you have that, again, you, I also think when you have that kind of, I don't want to say goodwill, but when you have that, it really is a form of love for one another. You tend to more willingly um, help someone out when their mistakes come to light. Cause we all as workers have certain things we don't do well. And if you have an environment where the leader is not making you petrified of failure or petrified of making a mistake and you, everyone on the team can say, look, this is what I think I do well, or they could tell you, this is what you do well. This is what you struggle with. If there's that sort of openness or that, that positive, um, atmosphere around one another, you're probably more likely to say, okay, well, I know Jim doesn't do this well, but he's really good at this. Let me supplement this. Let me do a little bit more work here because someone has to, and we're a, we're a team. And again, it's that love covers a multitude of sins sort of uh, attitude where it's, it's a posture we all should be having towards the work that, that God has given to us. Yeah, I think, in, in, what I would what I would heartily agree with is our feet need to be planted on love, mm -hmm. in order for that all to work. Um, I, I in a company where I am right now, the head of human resources uh, who is new has just made a statement saying we need to have a feedback culture. I want to I want to make us a feedback culture, but unfortunately, it's a company in which there is not sufficient trust. Mm -hmm. So what happens when I receive feedback in an environment where I don't have trust? I'm not listening. I'm going to defend. I'm going to feel conflict. like he's trying to, he's criticizing me or perhaps yep. trying to do something yep. even more sinister. I don't trust the motive or the means in which the feedback is being delivered. So our feet being planted in love is the first thing. What, what I wanted to comment on is I've got a couple of stories in mind. It's always good to root this in reality. One is a recent church story and one is a business story, which may bring to light uh, some of this, and it links to what I was saying earlier about our natural tendency to be egocentric, self-centered, and so on. Trust is built on a number of factors, and it's eroded by the degree to which I'm selfish or self-centered. Well, I came away from a recent um, meeting with a, a number of church members, and it was a church area where I visited a number of times and know the members very well. And it wasn't until I was praying and reflecting on this visit weeks later that I realized there is a person who is consistently exhibiting a behavior. I was trying to understand why it is that the, the, the meetings where this person is present aren't as fruitful, where the brethren are not learning as much and they're not as actively involved with one another in conversation. And then I realized it's because there is somebody in the room on those occasions who is choosing to behave in a way that's all about her. And so she will make statements or comments 
that turn the conversation towards her and then bring it onto a topic that's interesting to her, but that's very evidently uninteresting to everybody else in the room, mm -hmm. or it's in a way, in a tone or a tenor that is just not working for others. And others are trying to transmit that message to her, some of them more directly, some of them more um, indirectly. But it, the message isn't landing. And, and the unfortunate thing is that that church area is, is, is experiencing when that person is present, that church here is experiencing a, a, a real um, downturn in the, the healthy dynamic and the, the dynamic love and giving and, and iron sharpening iron that I see on all the other visits. Mm -hmm. And so I, that's an example. And I remember years ago, a colleague of mine, uh, we came out of a meeting and it, I'll give you a little context. He's somebody that I highly, highly regard and he's gone on to be successful um, beyond the Nestle group, but we were in the Nestle group and I was, I, I moved to a new office here in Switzerland where I was working with him for the first time. He and I had not worked so closely together before and he was struggling and he was about to leave the company and he didn't know it yet. <laughs> and my coaching helped him leave the company mm -hmm. because I, I, I had seen him over the years and I'd seen him becoming more and more frustrated, looking up and looking around and saying, I am a man of principle, and this company is not doing the things that I know it could do and that I'd like to be doing for it. And he was, he was in a position to be impactful for the company, but the company wasn't welcoming of it. And instead, people were, were shutting him down, and people were saying, no, that's not where we want to go. That's not what we want to do. And he, there was one particular meeting where it really got emotional, and I could see him struggling and other people reaching out to him and saying, um, you know, I, I think you, I think you're going about it the wrong way and really criticizing him. And we stepped out of that meeting and he asked me, he's like, so you saw that interaction. You're new in this environment. What could I be doing differently? And it was, what a great question, right? Isn't that a wonderful attitude as a colleague? And I said, it's difficult for me to talk about the content, but I can say one thing qualitatively. If the meeting that I just saw if the meetings you're having end up like that, where it's all about you and your emotional state and other people trying to take care of your emotional state or walking on eggshells because of your feelings or the way in which you're expressing yourself and your discontent, then you're not being effective, which was the bottom line in you pushing for change and asking the Nestle group to do things better. And that conversation he told me later helped him realize, I am not able to have the impact I want to have here. That's okay. And in a corporate setting, it's okay to forge his career elsewhere. And he went on to be very effective elsewhere, but he hadn't realized that he'd fallen into this trend of making it about himself because he mm -hmm. did. It wasn't his original intent to make it about himself, but the conversations were breaking down like that. And that egocentric, in the end, it was sort of egocentric took away all trust and then all the ability to do any progress and, and building it's such it's such a complicated thing man because I'm, I'm reflecting on my own career experience and just the because it's also hard to know where that line is and then how to self-evaluate sometimes too because it's like you said it might not be he might be correct that the company is fighting. Maybe they maybe they should do the changes that he's he's doing. And he might go somewhere else where <clears throat> it's more hospitable to that and have success. But there's at least for me, like I'm sort of very internally competitive. So I would want to have the skill set to be able to wherever I land be effective. And so while it's not necessarily morally wrong that that someone like him or like myself can't do that, it's also not the ideal like where there's just some people who can land in a situation and be effective and that's that, that's so amazing to me we talked about uh in the planning call uh someone who i've recently developed a fascination with and that is uh phil jackson the the basketball coach because my friends and i have gone back and rewatched the last dance which is a fantastic documentary and of course he three peats with the bulls once jordan retires he comes back he three peats again and the interesting thing about this is most people know the name Michael Jordan and they think he's this elite level leader, but he's got this reputation of being 
a very hard person to work with, uh, very um, uh, getting every, on everyone's case. I mean, Scotty Pippen, like two weeks ago, is still calling him out for being a bad teammate. And when you when you hear what you say, and you reflect on some of these these people who are seen as great leaders, and you and you see them sort of flying in the face of what you talk about in terms of best practice of leadership, he's not inspiring. You're like these guys are sort of motivated by fear or they don't want to get on MJ's bad side. And you and I are talking and all of a sudden you go, yeah, well, and, and this might be the most controversial thing that has been said yet on the CGN podcast. But I think I think the person who deserves the most credit for those successful Bulls teams is Phil Jackson, not Michael Jordan. Because because yeah. Jackson was able to take the intensity that made Michael Jordan a great player and mute that a bit teach him how to go from being all about him and his scoring to the triangle offense and, 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 and sharing the ball and was also able to manage Scottie Pippen and Dennis Rodman, which is wild. And then yeah. not only, yeah. And not only that, he, then when, when uh, the, he leaves the bulls team, takes a year off, goes to the Lakers and immediately three peats with them with Shaq and Kobe. That's with similar challenges, right? Yeah. Two extraordinarily strong personalities, Kobe Bryant, very, very similar to to Michael Jordan in terms of a personality that his teammates generally didn't appreciate. Mm -hmm. People people admire both of them for what their output, but the way in which they treated people, the way in which they talked, they weren't nice people. And Michael Jordan often gave credit to his what what he says. I believe what he's giving credit as fueling his achievement was an ultra competitivity mm -hmm. and a chip on his shoulder, right? Somebody is heckling him in the crowd. He wants to show them up. And so yeah. he outscores everybody on the court and maybe breaks an NBA record in that game mm -hmm. or whatever. And, and, and he's, he's, he, he was fueling off of it. People say that Michael Jordan was one of the most intense trash talkers mm -hmm. in the game that he, he, he was always in this, I don't know what you would call it, because it's not a Christian thing in any way. It was, nope. there was animosity in a lot of what he was doing. There was a competition and a desire to one up. And so there was a creative energy that was stimulated. But I think you're right. I think the coach, Phil Jackson, proved himself with very difficult personalities. It was known before he landed in Los Angeles that he had in Kobe and Shaq two people who had difficulty getting along, mm -hmm. who didn't really respect one another and who weren't giving one another the space to succeed that was necessary for championship championship uh, trophies. And that is- And, and the Zen master yep. managed to manage them. Yeah, and, it, and I, it's, it's impossible to listen to that and not think about the, the church and the difficulties we have in terms of giving people the space to achieve, uh, building capacity in people, inspiring people, being rooted in in uh in love and the thing that is that is very it's fascinating to me is that um the church has a, a history and also it still to some extent can have leaders who are more tyrannical whether i don't even necessarily mean from the very top but depending on who your local minister was um and then i think as a reaction to that you have a significant crowd in the the church of god community who believes there shouldn't be any leadership that it's a it's a sort of a flat dynamic mm -hmm. where um uh, everyone's in the same sort of position and then i think that that negates understanding the importance of the role of a leader because not everyone is a leader um and i don't even necessarily mean in an office where you're in a leadership position but just even like the the um uh, the mentality or the the sort of the informal leadership certain people give off versus others. Leaders have a very unique um, place in, in, a, in a social or team dynamic and how those leaders deal with the people um, around them, both over and under is hugely important. And then how the, the team functions with each other as, as a result is important. And I, I, I would, agree with i think you, you alluded to this statement early in the in the in the podcast um the, the the leaders that i admire the most are not the leaders who came in and fashioned the team in their own image right the leaders that i admire 
And I'm, I, I admire without fully understanding how they were able to do it, right? I have not led an $8 billion company, but I've coached leaders who do. And I watch what they do and I'm, I'm in awe of it. And I played a supporting role, but in conversations with them in private, I still can't tell you what they did. All I know is they went in with a certain mindset and I see it in this book that I mentioned earlier by Jim Collins, Good to Great. There is in these great leaders, certainly determination, absolute determination. When they set a goal, when they get the data and they know we can do that, they are determined and they stay with it and persevere and bring together all the elements will let them succeed. But they remain humble throughout. They will not believe themselves to be the smartest person in the room. And that gets to, I think, what you're, you're talking about. Moses facing in the desert, facing rebellion. Again and again, the scriptures in Numbers say he fell on his face. He fell on his face. How much of a, how clear of a leadership message is that? How many leaders take that posture to say, I am a man under authority and I do not need to defend my office. I do not need to fight this rebellion. I let God fight my battles. I'm here to serve and I'm taking that posture because I remember what God has called me to. Yeah. And I, and I've also fascinated with this, um, this concept that I don't, I'm not an expert in it, but this idea of weak and strong link systems and uh the for example you know a strong link system would be if you're on a basketball team they tend to be strong link and you have a great player you can funnel the ball to the great player and if you have a weakness if your small forward isn't very good you can just not give him the ball and you're in control the offense so you could for the strong link leads the team Whereas there are certain things where if the whole system isn't functioning, if you're only as good as the weakest link in that system. And I think the the church and really any company, I think Jim Collins speaks to this a bit, that you can have a company achieve a lot, but then when that leader dies and the company sort of falls apart, it's not really a uh, great company. It was built on this one person's image or mystique or whatever, because I think they built it like it was a strong link system that there are several people who drive this company's success. And you could be a hanger on someone who's uh, not really uh, contributing and we can make up for that. Whereas uh, I think the church is more of a weak link system that you said it doesn't, you can have a healthy congregation. You get someone who comes in making it about themselves or you get, you get something uh, someone come into a congregation stirring up discord and it really affects uh, the whole congregation or even someone who is as scripture talks about weak in the faith or even new in the faith that's why it's important for the congregation to band together and help that person and like circle the wagons because if we're only as good as the weakest link it should be you know us giving a hand up to the other person because we all either rise or fall together yeah corinthians in, in Corinthians, Paul is going directly at that point, right? He, he first talks about this with the man who's caught in, in sin and the church hasn't put him out. And he calls on the church, not the pastor. He's not addressing the pastor in 1 Corinthians 5. In fact, throughout the letter, I have trouble finding the pastor, right? Mm -hmm. But 1 Corinthians 5, he's saying, when you come together, right? The Old Testament, if someone was was and caught in a capital sin, the congregation stoned that individual worthy of death. The congregation comes together and puts this person out for their salvation, for good, in love, saying that we cannot keep in us because the, the translation of what you've just described, a little leaven is leavening all of us. Mm -hmm. And we are all becoming complacent and it's weakening all of us in our assiduous, diligent submission to everything that God expects of us. And then later in chapter 12, when he's talking about the role of a body, there's no body member that he can say, you can get away with that one being sick or injured. He doesn't say it. He uses the opposite language. Yeah. And I, I actually heard, <laughs> I read recently on, um, uh, someone was talking about someone equating someone's shortfalls to to David's um, shortfalls and still being a man after God's own heart. And this person was making an excuse saying, 
Well, David could get away with it because he was a national leader. He wasn't the spiritual leader. For example, Nathan would not have been able to get away with it because he was the spiritual leader at the time. Like, what in the world? <laughs> no, I mean, what's to me, what's interesting in David's story, you know, there, there are certainly many of his sins that are cataloged for us more than I think any other character in the scriptures. So for God to call him a man after his own heart means that it's not about the number of right. sins. Um, but rather the posture, and we keep yeah. talking about posture, I think yeah. it's important. David's reaction to rebuke was different from Saul's, mm -hmm. night and day. Saul defended, Saul excused, Saul justified or blamed. And David said, no, no, that's on me, you're right. And, and then when he saw in the census, the sin with the census, he saw the, the people of Israel suffering, even though when we read the context in the two passages carefully, it says that God was seeking to 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 deal with the sin in Israel, David takes accountability and he says, how can my sheep be suffering because of my misjudgment, my error? And he he humbly makes it his responsibility to write that. Yeah. Um, but I think when we think about David's sins, one of, the, one of the more important things is that David never sought to, to, to use his privilege to get away with it, right? When Absalom was chasing him. He didn't exercise his rights. He sought to love, right? He never tried to say, I deserve better. I was anointed. Absalom wasn't. He never said that. And he also, because again, he was someone who was firmly <clears throat> rooted in reality. Like I think a lot of these leaders are, because he he knew this was the heir of what he did with Bathsheba, that, that there would be conflict in his house. So he has his, one of his sons rapes one of his daughters, then Absalom reacts to that, and it's this never-ending cycle. But David, I think, was very like, okay, this is the situation, unfortunately. Like, God might um, – uh, I might have been repentant, and God might see me uh, as a man after his own heart. But there is a there is a reality to the decisions that were made and a reality to the way things are right now that cannot be avoided. I can't just lament it and say I wish things were different because it's not going to change anything. And I think in the church, it's similar that at this stage with um, the divisions and the challenges we face, uh, I think a lot of people say, well, it shouldn't be this way and we should be able to do X, whatever it is, be able to talk about X. And that might be true, but it's just not the reality right now. So how do you realistically move forward productively and godly in the reality we face? And it's not an easy thing. Like we can't sugarcoat it. And it's probably going to take a lot of trial and error, or it's going to involve a lot of being uncomfortable for one another, which has been another theme for me the last couple of years, that love is about being uncomfortable for someone else, willing to be uncomfortable to deal with an issue, and not just seeking, to your point at the very beginning of the podcast, seeking to leave circumstances to self-select into groups of people or circumstances that better fit your, uh, your already established um, desires, mm -hmm. but it's... How do you plant yourself in reality and get the job done that needs to be done and do so in a loving way that, again, inspires everyone that doesn't dwell on the negatives, but said, look, we can do this because God expects it of us. He wants it of us. He's called us to meaningful work. We can do that. It doesn't need to be uh, a burden. Yes. Well, you, what, what, just, just to make a, a further point that's, I think, very relevant in David's example, um, we've said this now a couple of different ways. It's not about the leader. It's not about me as a member. It's not about the self. And when David was rebuked by God through the prophet Nathan, the thing that God really brought across in that message wasn't the dis discrete piece of a sin of adultery or murder, but the point of saying you have given reason for the enemies of God to blaspheme. The greatest sin, it, it, it's kind of the counterpoint to Jesus Christ saying, by this shall all men know. God very much wants us to be lights. He expects that our actions bring into this world right? Like the, the moon brings the sun's light into the night, bringing into this world a light that the world does not know yet. And whether it recognizes it or not, God expects us to bring it as a witness. And where we fall short 
is where we break down. Not loving has a lot of consequences, and one of them is God's not able to do what he wants to do through us towards a whole lot of others whom we not even, may not even be aware of. We may not even be consciously engaging, but God is or wants to. And so I think this is, this is so much bigger than us. And that's what, at the end of Moses' life, when he and Aaron did what they did, God said the same thing to them. When they did what they did at that rock, God's correction to them said, you didn't, you didn't show my people my glory. You failed to reflect my glory. It wasn't, the, it wasn't the anger or the impatience that God criticized. He said, you lost the plot. The, the, the objective for me calling you isn't this moment that's so difficult for you. It's a greater purpose where God's work in all time is salvation. And it's not salvation of the first fruits. It's salvation of everyone. We being a vehicle through which he does that. And so for us, when I think of leadership, and again, leadership in the broadest sense, we have to step up to what God gives us, whether we're perceiving a bunch of people reporting to us and being paid by us or not. The leadership that we can do or that God can accomplish better, that God can accomplish through us, we may not see, we may not know, but let's get on our knees and let's humble ourselves before God and say, please get me out of the way. Please use what you want in me. Please use what you put in me that you want to use. And please, whether I understand it or not, help me to, to, to be a useful instrument for you doing that great work that only you see with full clarity. Amazing. Agree 100%. Great, great way to end, man. That's like, I can't think of a better way to end the episode than with that. Great admonition to, to close things out. But uh, we could, I mean, this is a topic that's, so important. I don't know if it ever gets less important, um, no, no matter what the situation we're we're facing. But you probably have a podcast uh, dedicated to this subject only, and have plenty of material uh, for the rest of eternity. So, but we're, we're really we're really glad you came on, Jonathan. Really appreciate your time and uh, your insight. Well, it's a pleasure. It's, uh, it's it, obviously we uh, we didn't find it difficult to to talk through issues on this, and so uh, no. I, I I hope that you and your audience keep keep probing on this and keep letting God open that topic up for us. I think there's a lot for us to gain. Absolutely. Take care, everybody. Thanks. See you next time. <laughs>